welcome back to Cindy's Library and today I'm going to talk about everything that I read in the month of June. So let's get to it. I started off, uh, I may have read something before it, but Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. My first Daphne du Maurier is a I guess you could call it a modern gothic romance. Modern as in early 20th century. I think it was written in the 30s. So it's not like it was written at the time of the Mysteries of the Bothell or something like that. And we start with our heroine. We never even learn her name. And she, I think it's an unfashionable uh, place somewhere in Italy with her husband because her husband doesn't want to meet anyone he knows. She has to be very careful of the topics they discuss. And as she gets into this, uh, she thinks about how all of this started five or ten years earlier. At which time, she wasn't that long out of school. Sadly, her parents had both passed away and hadn't really left her much of anything. And so she was a companion uh, to an older lady. Uh, don't see a husband, so she may have been a widow. She has a daughter, I know, in New York. She may even have been American. But they were... Were they in Switzerland? South of France? A popular resort area like that. I think it was the South of France. And... Our heroine, she's still being young, feels very out of place, very awkward, doesn't feel like she fits into this society. She could definitely tell a difference in how she is treated compared to her employer. She's treated like a servant, basically. But she ends, well, I should say both of them end up running t into a handsome, wealthy gentleman. Her employer has a thing about going after these types of people and introducing herself to them. She wants to be known to them. She's a groupie, basically. And one Thing leads to another. She gets to know this gentleman. And, well, her employer is going to leave, and so he proposes. And she says yes. So they have a wonderful honeymoon around Europe, several places. And then they go back to England and his estate, which I should remember the name of, since it's a major part of things. It, is his, it has been in his family for years. The thing is, when they get there, our heroine is very uh, intimidated by the very stern housekeeper. The other servants aren't so bad, but Mrs. Danvers, she loved our gentleman's first wife, Rebecca. Uh, probably helped bring Rebecca up. And so she wants to keep everything the same way as Rebecca had it. And she's always talking about Rebecca. And our heroine feels like she's always being compared to Rebecca. With unfortunate results on her side. 
Uh, she starts wondering whether her husband loves her or whether he still loves Rebecca. There are some mysteries, of course, around this house. And uh, let's just say uh, things go on from there. Very, very atmospheric, very, very gothic. There are ties to Jane Eyre. I understand there are ties to Wuthering Heights. Um, our main heroine, and I have to call her that because she's not even given a name. It's always Rebecca this and Rebecca that. Um, She's a very interesting protagonist because at the beginning she is so intimidated and uncertain of herself. Very, very, very passive. Interesting choice. I uh, have to say one part where I cheered where was about the middle where she actually did start standing for, for herself to Mrs. Danvers. Um, it's also interesting because at the start, since our heroine is reminiscing and she starts that first by considering what her life at that point is like and then going back to see uh, how it all started for her. That's an interesting technique. We already know how things are going to end up and some hints of some things. But it's the journey of how we get there. That's the real thing, of course, in these type of stories. I can see why it is a masterpiece. Can't say this particular one was a favorite of mine. But it's me, not the book. I'm not sure this type of thing, this type of book is for me. Um, and well, let's just say what our heroine ends up finding out does cast a new light on everything. And I can't really say much more than that about the plot, I think. But I am not sorry I have read it. Daphne du Maurier, uh, she is vivid and brilliant, very good at uh, describing what's going on internally with our heroine, what she's thinking about, so we completely understand her position throughout everything. So, don't know if I'll try it anymore, Daphne de Maurier. Like I said, not sorry I tried it. You can definitely see why it's a modern classic. And if it sounds interesting to you, I would say give it a go. Let's see, what else did I read? I read... The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. As it says here on the front, a fantastic bus ride from hell to heaven, a round trip for some, but not to others. So basically, we start out in this rather dismal place. A bunch of people there get on a bus and end up going to somewhere else. Uh, the beginning part of heaven, I guess you might say, is what we discover it is. And these people on the bus are met by glorious, wonderful beings who are trying to convince them to stay. Very, very philosophical about the nature of uh, what hell is, what heaven is. Let's see if I can find um, C.S. 
some of the great quotes. Oh, here's one. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. And here's another one. That's why at the end of all things, the blessed will say, we have never lived anywhere except in heaven, and the lost, we were always in hell, and both will speak truly. Main guy we are following sees a lot of the interactions between people from the bus and these beings. He also has one of these beings himself, who ends up being George MacDonald. It's a fun, surprisingly deep read, not meant to be taken literally. But as far as an idea, uh, at least uh, philosophically, what uh, this is describing, I think it's pretty accurate. But don't go to this for theology. C.S. Lewis did not do theology, at least in this book. Oh, I also read Every Needful Thing, Essays on the Life of the Mind and the Heart. It was edited by Melissa Weising Inouye and Kate Holbrook. And so this has, I think, around 16 essays or so written by various women who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and who are also academics or professionals in one way or another. And they talk about their experiences of oh, living the life of the mind and the heart, how both are integrated. And sometimes the tension between the two as well. It's interesting is the fact that all these essays are by women who are also uh, professionals and are also members, but they come from such a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, there's uh, one who was born in China. There's one from, at least, there's probably several from Central and South America, some from the Isles of the Sea, Europe, Africa, and all sorts of uh, different professions, scientists, medical people, academics and literature, uh, history, uh, political science, mathematician, a ballerina, all sorts of different things here. And I found it quite interesting. So if you're interested in this subject at all, you might want to pick it up. Let's see. Oh, I didn't read most of this till June, but I did it. I reread Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. Such a nice uh, revisit with Anne going to have to read some more one of these days. And for those of you who don't know, she is an orphan and she is sent to the Cuthberts, uh, Matthew and Marilla, or maybe I should say Marilla and Matthew, sister and brother at Green Gables. They asked for a boy. Uh, to help Matthew around the place. They end up with Anne instead, who is a girl with red hair, a big imagination, loves to talk, a bit of a temper, 
In fact, she is very human, and so are the inhabitants of Avonlea, which is where Green Gables is located. And she is just such an endearing heroine, and so many of the characters in here are also memorable, starting with Marilla and Matthew, uh, Diana Barry, who is Anne's bosom friend, uh, there's Gilbert Blythe, her frenemy, <laughs> Mrs. Lind, the town gossip, I guess you could call her. Yeah, she does seem to be worse than most. Big heart. She'll do anything to help you. But a bit of a gossip. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely to revisit. Then, <clears throat> I was inspired, I think it was Kate Hal. And I can't remember her channel. I'll try to connect or remember to link it down below. But the Sherwood Ring by Elizabeth Marie Pope. So this is the story of Peggy, newly orphaned. Um, she's not quite old enough to be out on her own, even if such a thing was thought of in her time, which I'm not sure. Well, there are cars though. So, definitely early-ish 20th century. So she's sent to live with her eccentric uncle, who is very mysterious, wants nothing really to do with her, leaves her at loose ends. The thing is that the house that her uncle has is full of mysteries. And there's also the fact that Peggy can see ghosts, the ghosts of the house. Uh, they're not malevolent or anything, but she learns of their stories. They're actually there more to support her than anything else. But like I said, she learns their stories and she learns about these former inhabitants of this house who lived there during the American Revolution. And there's a spy ring in the neighborhood. And the guy from there, he comes to try and find a spy ring. He has his sister. There's also the girl next door. And there's the spy himself. Yeah, we even get some from him. So I would say at least two thirds of this book is actually being told about what happened in this past. Anyway, I absolutely loved it. Very, very fun and well written. Yeah, I would say perfect for teens, maybe even middle grade. See, I also read Over Sea and Under Stone, which is the first of the Dark is Rising sequence by Susan Cooper. It's been too long since I've read these. So this says the store this is the story of Simon, Jane, and Barney come to a village on the Cornish coast for the holidays with their parents and great uncle Mary. And they discover a manuscript in the attic that starts them on an adventure, one bigger probably than they were thinking. And there's lots of ties to Arthurian lore. So I first read this in sixth grade. I loved it then. It holds up still. I also read 
and looked at Lord of the Rings sketchbook by Alan Lee. This is full of literally sketches he did when working on the Lord of the Rings, just like this, and even a few paintings, watercolors primarily, I think. And he also describes his experiences of working on the movie, on the movies, I should say, and uh, some of his processes for doing this. And if, also how he first learned to love Tolkien. So I enjoyed reading it. Glad that I did so. Well, for June, of course, I had to read a Midsummer's Night stream and finish it up on Midsummer's Day, of course. This is by William Shakespeare. It's hard to say exactly what this is about because it starts with four lovers whose love is mixed up going into the woods and there are fairies. There's also a troop of actors and they all get tangled up in the woods and by the end, it's all untangled for us. This is a comedy. So yes, as someone said in all Shakespeare's comedies, everyone gets married at the end. But, in the process of doing this, we have some hilarious things happen, including one of the players having his head turned into the head of an ass, as in a donkey. So, glad to reread it. This was a favorite from school and still as good as ever. Okay, I also read two stories here by Ivan Turgenev. Let's see. Uh, I read The Diary of a Superfluous Man. And I also read King Lear of the Steps. So The Diary of a Superfluous Man, he is dying and so he's writing out some stories from his life the main one being that he well the main one being the one point in his life where he felt like he could be someone and there was love involved but none of it worked out but still the highlight of his life then King Lear of the Steps, you have some guys in the tavern, and one says, I've met a Hamlet before, and another says, oh, I've met uh, maybe a Richard III before, something like that. And the mean guy, he says he's met a King Lear before. And so he starts telling the story of when he was growing up and this extremely impressive guy in this neighborhood with two daughters, one of them married, one of them a suitor, and how he sets his will to give them everything then and what happens to it. We'll just say it does not go well. Both of these are more tragic, although they're are some comedic elements as well to them. Very interesting and very, they feel very Russian to me. Or maybe that's just me. But I enjoyed reading them. And I read A Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England by Brandon Sanderson. <laughs> Ah, I read this practically as soon as it arrived, and it was a fun read. Glad I read it. Um, basically, a guy wakes up in a medieval milieu 
with no memory of who he is, he doesn't know where he is or anything like that. Um, he wakes up in the middle of what is clearly an explosion. The main thing besides himself there are pages from a book, which is the Frugal Wizard's Handbook for Surviving Medieval England. So, at least for the first part, a lot of what he's doing is trying to get other pages so he can read them and try and figure out what is going on. And it goes on from there. I did a full review of this. Try to remember to include that uh, down below. And then I also read Gaudy Night by Dorothy L. Sayers. Now, this is a Lord Peter Whimsy book, and it actually is mostly Harriet Vane. Uh, he goes to Oxford for a gaudy night, basically a reunion of alumni. And there are mysterious things happening. Nasty notes, nasty messages, uh, painted on walls, nasty notes left under doors, things like that, destruction of property. So Harriet is asked to investigate and um, as time goes on, uh, she asks Lord Peter for help. That's what this book really is about, is Harriet and Peter's evolving relationship. And it is wonderful. I greatly enjoyed it. I think I did a full review of this as well. So I'll try to remember to link that too. So let's see if I missed anything. Oh, I read Once Upon a Tone by Oliver Darkshire. I should say I listened to Once Upon a Tone by Oliver Darkshire. And it is basically him telling about what it is like to be a rare bookseller. He describes customers, he describes the building, he describes how he got into it, how it evolved over time. I think he started maybe 2012-ish, something like that. And so, very interesting. I can see that it takes a certain kind of person to be a rare bookseller. But I'm glad we have those people. Glad we have well, everyone because I am myself. Some things come more naturally to me. I'm better at some things and other people are better at other things. And other people have different personalities and it makes the world so interesting. See, I also read or rather listened to The Pleasures of Writing and Other Essays by A. A. Milan. It's exactly what it says. These are essays by A. A. Milan. Sound like the kind of thing he would have written for newspapers or periodicals. Uh, very uh, just enjoyable. He has such an enjoyable voice to read, or in my case, listen to. Not literally, since he didn't read them, but figuratively. Just calm and peaceful, while also being very interesting. So let's see. So I did that and that and that and that and that. Oh, the other big thing that I did this month was I read the Aeneid for Ancient Sathan. I got through it. Uh, 
The Aeneid is basically the story of Aeneas. He is a great warrior of Troy. Of course, Troy falls, so it tells how he uh, manages to survive the fall of Troy. He leads other survivors on a quest for a new homeland, and the gods point him basically to the founding of Rome. So there's plenty of voyages and adventures with that, including a stay at Carthage, and uh, the queen of Carthage, Dido, falls in love with him with disastrous results. Uh, don't like what happens to Dido. And then there's also a journey to the underworld. And when they finally get to uh, Italy and Rome, at first they are welcomed by the people there, the Latins. But Juno hates the Trojans. And so she stirs up trouble and fighting breaks out between the Trojans and the Latins. So in some ways the first half of the book is like the Odyssey. In other ways, the second half of the book is more like the Iliad, complete with descriptions of who's related to what famous ancestor or which god or goddess and complete with who kills who. So I'm glad I read it. I'm hopeful that when I go back to the Divine Comedy it will be helpful and also with other things going forward. Don't know that I will ever read it again, although it's possible I could go back and reference some specific parts. As for where I rank it, um, I would say it's between the Iliad and the Odyssey. And there was more going on that I could understand and appreciate overall than in the Iliad. And I still probably like the Odyssey the best, but that's just me. I understand how to read uh, Germanic things, but I'm not sure I know very well how to read ancient Greek and Roman things, unfortunately. I have to try some other things and maybe work on that a bit. But in the meantime, that is what I read for June say overall it was a successful uh, reading month and that I completed a lot of things that I wanted to and if any everything wasn't the most enjoyable shall we say um, they were all things that I could at least appreciate so there's that I'd love to hear how your reading month was down in the comments or if you want to let me know what you thought of any of the things that I read this month I'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much for stopping by. I truly do appreciate it. So until next time, hope we all stay safe and healthy and as always, happy reading!